two handouts for today. I hope you found them on a seat in the back. You'll see one called the Missions Arrow, which has been following the same outline you've been seeing all along. You can see that the Missions Era, as we've defined it, starts in chapter 13 of the book of Acts and runs through the end of the book. And so we were introduced to Saul of Tarsus back in chapter 7, but then in that portion of the scripture, the foundation of the church era, we saw his conversion and we're reintroduced to him. And in 13, we begin to see his real ministry as Paul becomes not the only missionary, but the primary missionary uh, of the early church, founding churches all over the northern part of the Mediterranean world. You might recall when we were talking about the church era that thousands of Jews from all over the Mediterranean world, and Luke lists there the different portions of the world that they were from, had gathered in Jerusalem for Pentecost, for, for Passover through Pentecost, Everyone there who had been there at Passover time, which would have been the vast majority of them, understood who Jesus was. They knew that he was claiming to be the Messiah. They had seen him come into the city on what we call Palm Sunday. They heard him teach for several days in the temple. And then they heard that he was arrested by night, tried before the Sanhedrin, tried before Pilate, condemned, flogged, crucified, buried. But the day that he was crucified, several things happened. The sun went out of the sky at noon, and it stayed dark for three hours. It was not an eclipse. The longest eclipse lasts about 14 minutes. There's no such thing as a three-hour eclipse. And um, so, and then there are these stories. Uh, well, the day he died, the sun went out of the sky, earthquakes rocked the city, and the two-foot veil that separates the Holy of Holies from the holy place was split into starting at the top, going all the way to the bottom. How do you explain those things? Yeah. Except that they just crucified the Messiah, the Son of God. And then there's all these rumors, starting the first day of the week, that people have seen him raised from the dead. And um, so Jesus stayed before he ascended to the Father 40 days after Passover. And so Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, is only 10 days after the Ascension. What's happening on Pentecost morning? Well, the disciples, about 120 of them, gathered in this same upper room that Jesus had them secure for Passover. They're praying. The Holy Spirit comes upon them in power. There's uh, a tremendous... Uh, filling of the Holy Spirit. We were talking about this during the week. 120 disciples go down and go out into the crowd that had assembled. They heard what sounded like a mighty windstorm downtown by the temple. And they all came together to hear what this sound was. It doesn't say there was a windstorm, but it sound like a mighty wind. They all came together to see what was going on. 119 disciples disperse into the crowd and begin to preach the gospel to them. And everybody from all over the Mediterranean world is hearing this witness in their own native language. So Peter stands up to preach. Preaches this powerful message. Repent. 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and about 3,000 received Christ and were baptized that day. What happened to those 3,000? Well, some of them may have lived in or near Jerusalem, somewhere in Judea. But the vast majority of them were visitors from out of town. What happened? They all went home and took the Christian faith with them. And that was God's evangelism plan. Get these people saved, disperse them all over the known world. You know, there was a thriving church in Rome. Paul wrote his Roman letter to the church in Rome. Paul had never been there. No missionary had ever been there. How did that church get in Rome? Well, people from Rome were at Pentecost. People from all over North Africa were there at Pentecost. This is how God spread the church. And so as Paul begins his missionary journeys... Uh, as the apostle to the Gentiles, he's going to places where some Christians were already, but he is mostly leading new converts to the Lord. He goes into a place. Where does Paul always go first to preach when he goes into a new town or a new city? Where does he always go first? goes to the synagogue. Why? Well, two reasons. Number one, it's an easy place to preach because there's a tradition in the synagogue that if you have somebody come in who's new, you give them an opportunity to expound on the lesson of the day. That's how Jesus preached in his hometown of Nazareth. He was in the synagogue that day. They had the reading, and it happened to be from Isaiah. And Jesus uh, read the passage from Isaiah, and he said, this day, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, and they all got upset. But that's the, that's the tradition. You give the visiting preacher an opportunity to speak to the congregation. And the other reason why he always went to the synagogue is because the gospel of the Messiah it's for the Jew first and then also the Greek. That's God's plan. To the Jew first and then also to the Greek or to the Gentile. And so he would, and in one city, he goes in, preaches in the synagogue. Some people believe. A lot of people got upset with him. <laughs> what did he do? He moved right next door. There was a believer who lived right next door to the synagogue and he moved in. Anyway, so this is where we are. We're in the mission era. I didn't prepare a map. I wish now that I had, but I didn't. I didn't think about it. But if you have your Bible and you have a map in the back of Paul's missionary journeys, you can turn to that for just a second. Now, the two sheets that you have, the one that says the missions era, you'll notice that the four major subjects in the mission era are the first missionary journey, the second missionary journey, the third missionary journey, and then Paul's journey to Rome. That's an excellent outline. That's exactly the way the book of Acts is laid out. If you looked at the second sheet that says the missionary journeys of Paul, you can see that letter A, the first missionary journey, and that's chapters 13 and 14. And then we have a brief interlude about the Jerusalem conference, which is chapter 15. The second missionary journey starts 
in Acts 15 and goes down through Acts 18. And then the third missionary journey is uh, Acts 18 to 21. And on the back side of that paper is Paul's arrest and his trials before Felix and Festus and Agrippa and then his journey to Rome. That's exactly the way. This, by the way, is an outline of the book of Acts that I pulled right off of my favorite Bible site on the internet. And, and um, sometimes doing something like this, going into a reputable Bible site, finding an outline of a book, printing it off, kind of getting the outline in your head, and then as you read through the book, you know, okay, now I understand what's going on in this passage, and this helps me keep track. There's all kinds of wonderful Bible tools available for us if we'll just take our study seriously and invest a little time. So looking at the map, if you have it in front of you, uh, Mediterranean Sea, this great big body of water, uh, Judea is at the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. That's the nation of Israel. Go north out of Israel, you go into uh, Syria. And as you head uh, almost out of Syria into what is today modern-day Turkey, uh, one of the little towns on the coast is Syrian Antioch. That's the place from which Paul sailed on all of his missionary journeys. He sailed out of Antioch. As you head north out of Syria into modern-day Turkey, there are regions, Cilicia, Pamphylia, Cappadocia, Lycia, uh, up in the northern coast uh, of uh, uh, Turkey at, at the bottom of the Black Sea, Bithynia and Pontus. These are all names that you'll see as you read through the book uh, of Acts. But right smack in the middle, running down the country, is the area of Galatia. That's a province, that's an area. And so when Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia, that's our book of Galatians, right? The western coast, probably western one-third of modern-day Turkey, is what they referred to as Asia and we refer to as Asia Minor to differentiate from the other Asia, which is India, <laughs> China, Southeast Asia, but the western end of the nation of Turkey, they refer to as Asia. So when it says that Paul went and spent four years in Asia, we're talking about western Turkey. If you go up to the north western corner of Asia, of, of um, modern day Turkey, there's a little town on the coast called Troas. And from Troas, Paul made the relatively small leap from Asia into Macedonia. Macedonia is the northern part of that peninsula, and the southern part of that peninsula is Greece. Now, it's all Greece today, but in those days, it was Macedonia in the north and Greece in the south. When you go from Asia Minor, Cross a narrow strip of water and you land in Macedonia, you have just gone from primarily Semitic culture 
to Greece, Greek and Roman culture. Everything changes. You go from one little country to another little country, and the language and the culture and everything is entirely different. When I lived in upstate New York, we used to go across the river to Canada all the time especially pre-9-11. You just get the car, drive over the bridge. They barely stop you. You know, where are you going? I'm going to Kingston for the day. Have a good time. <laughs> when you go from America into Canada, I mean, you're in an entirely different country. The language and the culture are the same, except that they say A a lot. Okay. Here's a loony. Go buy a bag of milk, eh? You know? Uh, but we had an entirely different experience on a mission trip when we left out of San Diego and went down to Mexico. There's an imaginary line in the sand that separates California from Mexico. And when you cross that line, everything changes. I mean everything. Everything in California is lush and green. Everything in Mexico is dirt brown. It's the same area on the coast. What's the difference? The difference is culture. In America, we plant things. We grow things. But I, I'm, I'm just talking about grass and decorative hedges and landscaping. Mexico, they don't have the culture and they don't have the money to landscape things. Everything's different. Obviously, the language is different. The culture is different. I know there are places that more, are more impoverished than Ensenada, Mexico, but I have, I have never seen such devastating poverty in my life as Ensenada, Mexico. Now, down where the cruise ships come in, it's, it's all nice, and wealthy. But you drive a quarter of a mile up the hills, and you see people living in cars and living in tents. Everything's different because the language and the culture and the history is different. And so when Paul goes from Asia Minor and primarily Semitic cultures over to Macedonia, he has entered a new world. If I told you a line from a hymn or asked you about the expression, we have heard the Macedonian call today, does anyone know what that refers to? You, and we're going to look at that. In Southern Baptist life, the Macedonian call is the call to foreign missions. Y'all didn't come up in RAs and GAs and Actines and <laughs> WMU and Brotherhood. The Macedonian call is the call to foreign missions. We have a home mission board. Well, now it's called the North American Mission Board, which is missions in the United States and Canada. Same culture. The International Mission Board, which used to be called the Foreign Mission Board, is anywhere else other than our culture. The Macedonian call is come over here and help us and you go into a place where the language and the culture is entirely different. And we're going to look at that. So uh, the missionary uh, call to, to foreign missions was Paul's second missionary journey. But notice this, because this lays it out pretty well, in the missions era. Galatians, that's central Turkey for two years. Greece, southern end of the Greek peninsula, the Macedonian peninsula, three years. 
third missionary journey, Asia, and again, that's the western end of Turkey, for four years. Every time he went out, he stayed out longer. Do you notice that? Two years of the first journey, three years of the second journey, four years in the third journey, and then in the last one, he's arrested in Jerusalem and transported to Rome. Paul's first missionary journey, he and Barnabas are selected by the Holy Spirit, and that's exactly what the scripture says, to travel to Galatia, take the gospel to the Gentiles living there. They depart from Antioch, the point of departure for all three missionary journeys, I already said that, and are in Galatia for two years experiencing encouraging results. Really, it was a very, very successful journey very little opposition. After they return to Jerusalem, a council is held amid much controversy which determines that the Gentiles do not have to become Jewish in order to become Christians. I did note it in, in my reading of Acts the other day in preparation for this lesson that the people who were stirring up the most trouble in Jerusalem about Paul preaching to the Gentiles. And Peter said, I preached to him first. Don't get mad at him. God told me to preach to Gentiles, and I preached to Gentiles, and you all knew it. But those who were troubled about the fact that these Gentiles weren't submitting to the law, they weren't submitting to circumcision, they weren't becoming Jews in order to become Christians, were former Pharisees who had become Christians. They, want, they still were stuck in their legalism and their strict adherence to the law of Moses. And they settled at this Jerusalem conference that there are a couple of things that the law has always taught and that we want all Christians to still follow but they basically decided you do not have to submit to the law and you do not have to become a Jew in order to be a Christian. And that was huge. That was a huge decision. And that happened uh, again in chapter 15 of the book of Acts. Second missionary journey, Greece for three years. Paul leaves from Antioch again to visit believers from his first journey. However... He receives a vision from a man of Macedonia. Well, actually, if I had looked at that, I would rewrite that. He received a vision from God of a man of Macedonia, and he determined to go on into Greece with the gospel message for the Gentiles there. He travels in Greece for three years. Third missionary journey, Asia for four years, Paul leaves to encourage the believers from his first two trips to spread the message of the gospel into Asia. He has great success and great opposition. In Ephesus, the whole city breaks out in a riot over his visit. One of my favorite Bible teachers said that uh, everywhere Paul went, he either had revival or he had a riot. Sometimes he had both. And uh, he went on to say something like, we ought to have revival, and there's probably nothing wrong with having a riot either. Though Paul is warned that he will be imprisoned upon his return to Jerusalem, he returns anyway after being in Asia for four years and is immediately arrested. Number four, trials and imprisonment. Jewish leaders in Jerusalem have Paul arrested on false charges. Since his life is threatened there, even under guard, he has moved to Caesarea, the Roman capital of the area. He was not safe in Jerusalem, so they took him to Caesarea. Caesarea is up on the coast. No one's going to come there to cause trouble for Paul because there's a huge Roman garrison in Caesarea because that's where Herod's palace was, that's where the, uh, that's where King Agrippa lived, that's where the Roman governors, Felix and Festus, lived. Nobody's going to cause trouble for Paul in Caesarea. There he is tried under three men, Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. 
Felix and Festus are Greek names, and they are uh, Roman governors. Agrippa is a Jew, and he is kind of a puppet king. He's from the Herod family. In order to thwart a miscarriage of justice in the process, Paul exercises his right as a Roman citizen to take his case before Caesar in Rome. He's taken to Rome, but his case never comes to trial. At the end of the book, Paul has been in a Roman prison for two years. And that's where the book of Acts ends. Paul's in prison in Rome. He's, he's not in a dungeon. He's under house arrest. He's able to write. He's able to receive visitors, but he's always under guard. And uh, so he still has a flourishing ministry in Rome, even though he's technically in jail. He's under house arrest. But that's where the book of Acts ends. Now let's take a look at the second one for just a minute, The Missionary Journeys of Paul. I just want to read a couple of passages for you today and comment. Okay. Let's look at Acts chapter 13. Any questions yet before we keep moving? Sure, sure. Um, the great thing about this time in the life of the world is that no matter what your native tongue was, everyone spoke Greek. Everyone spoke Greek. So you could speak in a native Semitic dialect somewhere in Asia, but you also spoke Greek. And you were, by this time, raised that way. I don't know if you've ever heard of European children who can speak French and Italian <laughs> and some German, and, and because they're raised there and the cultures are all fairly close and they can speak all those languages and it's just easy. Every person in Asia, every person in uh, the former uh, Greek Empire, which is now the Roman Empire, but the former Greek Empire had been Hellenized, instilled with Greek culture, and so everybody spoke Greek. And so Paul could write a letter in Greek and send it anywhere in the known world, and they could read it. I was thinking about this the other day. Jesus, we know, spoke Aramaic. I have absolutely no doubt that he also spoke Greek because he had to in order to conduct business. Even in Palestine in those days, he had to speak Greek. Well, I'm just looking, I, I, I understand, you know, the divine side of his nature, but I'm just, you know, saying he had to have, everyone spoke Greek. He's on trial before Pontius Pilate, whose native language is Latin as a Roman. Jesus is speaking Aramaic. How did they communicate? They probably spoke to each other in Greek because that's the one language they had in common. Now, that's just my guess, and I could be wrong. I've been wrong many, many times before. The amazing thing about the Gospels is that, and I was talking to Terry about this last week, Jesus is speaking in Aramaic. But when the gospel writers wrote it down, they wrote it down in Greek. 
if you take the Greek text and you go back and you translate that into Hebrew, which is the closest thing we have to, to Aramaic, a lot of the poetic patterns that we see in the prophets show up in the teaching of Jesus. He was preaching just like an Old Testament prophet. But he spoke, he spoke in Aramaic, and they wrote it down in Greek. How about that? I'm not as close to that as you are having heard it firsthand from your pastor, but I've heard stories like that for years. You know, someone is speaking in their language, but other people are hearing it in their language, which I think is the miracle of Pentecost, right? The Galileans were all just speaking Aramaic. It wasn't like God gave them the ability to somehow speak in another language, but other people were hearing it in their language. And, and you know, the gift of tongues, as we like to refer to it, because that's the way the King James translates it, it's the gift of languages. The tongue is a language. It's the gift of languages. So, uh, where's there, we, you were just nodding or something? Okay. All right. Yeah. They heard it in their language. That's right. All right, I am in chapter 13. Now, there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then when they had fasted and prayed, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And then it begins to tell the story of Paul and Barnabas on their first stop in Cyprus. They went out first to the island of Cyprus. I want to show you also what I was referring to earlier as the Macedonian call. This is Acts 16. That was the call of Paul and Barnabas to missions. In Acts 16, in the opening verses of chapter 16, it's where Paul meets and recruits Timothy for the first time. At verse 6 in chapter 16, they pass through the Phrygian and Galatian region, central Turkey, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, western Turkey. They passed through the middle because at this time the Holy Spirit was saying, don't go to Asia. Holy Spirit knows when the timing is right. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Holy Spirit, Spirit of Jesus, same thing, different way of saying it. They are listening to the direction of the Holy Spirit, and he's basically saying, don't go here, 
don't go there. They know where to go only when they're given permission and direction by the Holy Spirit. And passing to, uh, by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And Troas is that city on the coast uh, just south of Macedonia. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to them. You see, how does he know it's a man of Macedonia? Probably different skin color and different dress, different, different clothing, because the people over in Macedonia look totally different than the Semitic culture in Turkey. He knew it was a Macedonian just by looking at him or seeing him in his vision. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. A couple of things. The whole idea of open doors and closed doors comes from this passage of Scripture. We want to go here. The Holy Spirit says, no. Well, Let's go here. The Spirit of Jesus says, no. So they traveled to where they could go. Paul's given a vision. In the vision, the Macedonian says, come over here and help us. Open door. Paul says, pray for me for an open door for the gospel. You pray, God says no. Okay, no's a legitimate answer to prayer, by the way. So I pray God didn't answer me. Yes, he did. He said no. Closed door, closed door, open door. Go through the open door. And notice this other thing here. A vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he, Paul, had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Did you notice that? He turned to we. Why is it we? Huh? Huh? He was with him. Luke, who wrote this account, was a traveling companion of Paul, and in three different places in the book of Acts, the pronoun turns to we, because he was there on the trip and wrote about it from first-hand experience. Bible scholars, you know, they're incredibly creative, Bible scholars are, and they refer to these passages as the we passages. Isn't that smart? They're the we passages. Every time Luke includes himself in the telling of the story, he says we. And that's in three places in the book of Acts. Something happened in Macedonia. Macedonia is the place where the small town of Philippi is. It's a Roman garrison there. Uh, it wasn't a significant city. The church in Philippi wasn't very big. They didn't have a lot of money. But one thing the Philippians had was a great heart for God and a great heart for the Apostle Paul. And no matter where he went from there, they supported his ministry financially. Paul said, I would have starved if it hadn't been for the Philippian church. They kept supporting me in prison. You know, it, in, in prison in those days, you didn't get three hots and a cot. In, in, in prison in those days, if nobody from the outside was feeding you, you're going to die because the 
jailers don't feel compelled to help you survive your stay in jail. You go to jail, somebody outside's got to bring you food or you don't survive. And the Philippians kept sending him money, no matter where he was, so that he could survive. They were faithful to him. Now, yeah, yeah. And, and you kind of understand when he's writing his letter to the Philippian church, why there's such great thanksgiving and affection there. This was the one church out of all the churches that supported him. The rich, large church at Corinth, he's got to shame them into giving what they promised to give and didn't come through with yet. And the Philippians gave and gave and gave again. Paul starts his church with Lydia, who is a woman of means. She's a seller of purple fabrics. He led her to the Lord. And then I'm looking for, I'm looking for the Philippian jailer. The crowd rose up, verse 22 of chapter 16, the crowd rose up together against them. This is Paul and Silas. And the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded uh, to order them to be beaten with rods. And that's about as bad as you think it is. And when they had struck them with many blows, threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. They were probably in chains, if not in stocks. And he, having received such command, threw them, oh, there it is, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison house was shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. If you lost your prisoners, they were going to kill you anyway. And so he just decided to get it over with. Supposing that the prisoners had escaped, but Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself, we're all here. There was no prison break. And he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he had brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? One of the best questions written anywhere in the New Testament. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all those who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized with all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Isn't that a great story? Miraculous deliverance from prison by God sending an earthquake. And then the jailer is converted and he becomes, I guess, a founding member of the Philippian church. Uh, one more passage, and I dearly love this. And we're in Acts chapter 20. Paul is, uh, loves the Ephesian church. He spent a lot of time there. He knows these people. They know him. He is on his way now back to Jerusalem 
where he's already been prophetically warned, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to get arrested. Paul knew that, but he knew it was God's call in his life to go to Jerusalem. He knows he's going to get arrested, but he's going anywhere because this is what God told him to do, and he's being obedient. But everywhere he goes, people say, if you go there, you know, and, and so he doesn't want to stop at Ephesus, but he stops at a little town down the coast from Ephesus, and he sends word for the Ephesian elders to come down and meet him there. He's come off the boat, come on shore. They all meet on the beach. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. We talked about this Wednesday night in my little lesson on repentance. Repentance toward God, we always repent toward God because every time we sin, we sin against him. Regardless of who else our sin touches, every time you sin, you sin against a holy God. So when you repent, you repent toward God. Now, it's always helpful to go and repent toward the people that you sinned against also. But you repent toward God and you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, bound in spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. He knows exactly what he's getting into. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Verse 24 is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. I don't care what happens to me. My life is of no account. The only thing that matters is that I obey the commission that was given to me by the Lord Jesus. That's the only thing that matters. Finish your course. Do what the Lord told you to do. If you die doing it, praise God. I get to go home. But that's a powerful verse. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. I love passages like that. All right, we're out of time. I'd love to do a lot more, but it's getting late, so let's pray. God, I thank you for the example that we have in Scripture of men that you have called to preach the gospel. And we pray, God, that in the preaching and teaching of your word that we are being faithful and in the hearing of your word, we become doers of it as well. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.